This is the table of contents, so make sure annotations are enabled so that you can click on the different boxes to jump to different portions of this review. It is NCX and today I have a review of the QNIX QX2710 which uses a 2560 by 1440 resolution Samsung PLS panel as does the XSTAR DP2710 and they both use the same panel and they both use the same casing and have the same stand. Many people have reported getting image retention once they overclock their panels, so be wary that image retention may occur. Both the QNIX and XSTAR are known to overclock to at least 96Hz, and many people get theirs up to 120Hz. My unit also suffers from image retention once overclocked to 96Hz, and I found that setting the panel back to 60Hz for a while would get rid of the image retention. The non-Pixel Perfect QNIX and XSTAR sell for around $300 on eBay, and the Pixel Perfect version sell for around $350 to $400. I ordered a matte Pixel Perfect version from the eBay seller Hulu Star, and I also bought a 3-year square trade warranty for $50. The matte QNIX and XSTAR panels use the same light, semi-glossy coating found on Samsung PLS panels such as the Asus PB278Q, Samsung S27A 850D, and ViewSonic VP2770. The panel I just swapped in is the Samsung S27CE 750P, which I just recently reviewed, which also uses the same semi-glossy coating found on matte PLS panels. If available, I will always shamelessly use overclock.ru's reviewers macro images of displays pixels to show the different effects of different types of coatings on a display's pixels. As we can see here, the QNIX uses the same semi-glossy coating found on the other matte 2560 by 1440 Samsung PLS panels. So what does this all mean? Well, this means that the QNIX and XSTAR matte models have very clear matte coatings which don't have any perceivable grainy or sparkly effect, just like the Samsung PLS panels found in the ViewSonic VP2770, Asus PB278Q, and Samsung S27A 850D. So for those after a matte display, have no fear when buying the QNIX or XSTAR panels from eBay, since the matte coatings are very, very light, not grainy, and they do a great job of reducing reflections. The QNIX has the same glossy bezel as the XSTAR, and many of the other 2560 by 1440 IPS panels available on eBay from Korea, such as the Crossover 2720 MDP I use in most of my reviews, and the Crossover 2730 MDP. It does not have a height adjustable or rotatable stand, the only thing the stand can do is tilt a little bit. The QNIX has five buttons on the right side, two for brightness control, two for volume control, and the one on the far right is the power button. The back of the QNIX's case has this kind of matte, plasticky material which earwax and fingerprints don't really show up on, or grease marks, which is kind of nice. And there's the power input, a audio out for 3.5mm cords on the back, as well as a dual-link DVI input. So this is one of the single input models which lacks an OSD or menu as well as a scaler, so it has low input lag. And it just has this tiltable stand. There we go. The only way to remove the stand on the QNIX is actually by taking the display apart. Three things are required to take the QNIX apart to remove the stand. The first, and most important, is sex seal the lamb. Without sex seal the lamb, none of this would be possible. Secondly, you will need a screwdriver. And I don't know my screwdriver names, but you need one that looks like this. The third item is a pair of pliers. There are four screws that need to be removed. One here, one here, one here and one here, and removing them is fairly easy. A pair of pliers may be handy to pull the screws out from the plastic. So I already have removed two screws to fix the backlight bleeding on my display. So I only need to take two out, which I will take out. Make sure you have some sort of like plastic container to put these in so you don't lose them.
Once the screws are removed, make sure your sexy of the lamb is as close to the monitor as possible. This is very, very crucial. To actually pry up the bezel, moving the stand at the back, twisting it up and down seems to help pry it forward a bit. So once it's up a little bit, try and get your fingernail up in here. I don't recommend using anything metal because it chips away at the plastic and kind of bends it and it may break it. So using your fingernails, you're going to have to try and loosen this up. And it takes quite a bit of force and eventually it can just be kind of pulled off like so. I've already done this like four times so it's pretty easy to get it off. It may take a lot of force. Just do it slowly, better safe than sorry. It's best not to break it. So once it is pulled off, you can see the inside of the panel. Removing the panel itself is very easy. What you need to do is look in here and you'll see that the protruding plastic pieces from the casing are hooked over protruding metal bits from the panel itself. So what you need to do is pull on these and then lift the panel out. Here are the wires I was referring to in the back of the display. There are ones on the bottom right and there's not that much slack and there are the ones here in the center which kind of move over and rest on the right. So when pulling the panel out be aware of how much slack you have and make sure to only pull it up a little bit and very slowly and place it down gently because you don't want to wreck your $300 monitor. So now that we know how to dislodge the panel itself from the casing, I'm going to do it. So what I recommend doing is holding it up on the bottom left here. And you pull it back and pull it back. And now the panel itself is unhooked and you can tilt it up. So remember that before we remove it, you need to be aware of the wires here and here. There's enough slack to pull the panel up and back and rest it against the casing. So what I'm going to do is pull it up and just back a little bit. Make sure to only go a little bit because you will feel the wires being pulled on. To remove the stand's neck, all you need to do is loosen the two screws down here and it will come right out. There's one screw. And there's the other one. Now, the screws in mine, they're not the screws that actually came with the panel itself. I lost them, but the ones I'm using work. So all you have to do is pull off this piece of plastic and this piece of metal and pull the stand out. The last step is to put it back together. So all you have to do is kind of snap the bezel back on in place. And it's really easy and it shouldn't take too much force. You shouldn't have to like bash it in with your hands to get it back on or anything like that. I'm not pushing in the bottom because when I push in the bottom on mine it presses on the panel and it makes the backlight bleeding more obvious. But I will on the top. If you followed my steps carefully and didn't wreck your panel, you should be able to vase mount your new Cunix. It is time to talk about the Cunix's color presets, of which there is only one. Now if you want to see what the Cunix looks like out of the box, enable annotations and click on the link in the top left to jump to my Cunix color gallery video. The Cunix only has brightness controls and by default it is set to the maximum brightness out of the box, which is quite bright. The Cunix is the best looking monitor I have ever seen in terms of out of the box color quality. The only issue my Cunix had is that its color gamut extends a bit beyond the sRGB color spaces gamut so colors are slightly oversaturated however they're not very oversaturated like they would be on a wide gamut display they're only slightly oversaturated in this image the white triangle represents the monitors color gamut while the other one represents the sRGB color space the Cunix has the second largest color gamut but it's not quite as large as the Dell U2713H's and that is because the Dell uses a wide gamut GB LED backlit panel the Cunix's colors are slightly more vibrant than those of the ViewSonic vp 2770 Asus PB278Q, Samsung S278, 850D, and Crossover 2720 MDP I've reviewed, but they still look very, 
very natural. At 60 Hz, the QNX's gamma was very close to being perfect, but it wasn't quite as good as the gamma on the ViewSonic VP2770 I just reviewed or the Asus PB278Q. I measured the gamma at both 96 Hz and 120 Hz. The higher the Hz, the higher the average gamma, and the darker the colors get. The most common thing I came across on the forums such as the overclock.net forums is how dark the QNIX looks when overclocked, and that's because the gamma is raised at higher hertz. And this results in colors looking too dark and sometimes quite dull, as well as black crush or the loss of details in dark scenes. The QNIX lacks color controls, so the only way to correct the QNIX's gamma once overclocked is through software calibration. Fortunately, I have ICC profiles for the QNIX at 60, 96, and 120 Hz, all available within the written review, which is linked in the video description, as well as instructions on how to install an ICC profile. At 60 Hz, the QNIX's colors are simply amazing by default. The QNIX has deep blacks for an IPS or PLS panel with its native 1000 to 1 contrast ratio, accurate color temperature of around 6500K, as well as very accurate gamma. The main issue with the QNIX's colors at 60 Hz is that its color gamut extends a little bit beyond the sRGB color space, resulting in slightly oversaturated colors. While the QNIX's color quality is very close to being perfect at 60Hz and is one of the best monitors I've ever reviewed, it is important to note that the color quality does obviously deteriorate once the QNIX is overclocked. Due to the higher average gamma at 96Hz, and especially at 120Hz, some color shades end up looking too dull, dark, and desaturated, and shadow detail is definitely lost due to the higher gamma, especially at 120Hz, and there's some very obvious black crush when looking at dark scenes. Remember, I have ICC profiles which are available in my written review, which is linked in the video description, for 60Hz, 96Hz, and 120Hz. Since the QNIX lacks color controls, one has to solely rely on their software calibration program to calibrate the QNIX, and I use Basic Color 5 with my i1 Display Pro colorometer. At 60 Hz, software calibration barely does anything to the QNIX because it's very close to being perfect out of the box. Since it has proper color saturation thanks to its 125% sRGB color space coverage, it has deep blacks for an IPS or PLS panel with its 1001 native contrast ratio, proper shadow detail thanks to the accurate gamma, and very wide viewing angles and even colors, with no gamma shift. At 60Hz, calibration brings almost no noticeable improvements. However, once the display is overclocked, the gamma rises, resulting in the darkening and dulling of colors, as well as some black crush, which is why ICC profiles for the higher Hertz settings are necessary because they fix the gamma and make everything look nice and natural again. And remember my ICC profiles are available within my written review which is linked to in the video description. After calibration, the QNIX offers the second best colors I have ever seen from a display, as well as the second best white purity. The colors and white purity are very, very close to the Samsung S27A 850D. Now, when it comes to white purity, I mean whites which lack an obvious color tint. When displaying white screens on two monitors side by side, usually one will look red and one will look green. In my QNIX's case, the whites looked very, very pure. The QNIX beats the ViewSonic VP2770 in terms of calibrated color quality as well as the Asus PB278Q and crossover 2720 MDP. While the QNIX's colors are slightly more vibrant than all of the other 2560x1440 resolution displays I've reviewed, it means that its colors aren't as accurate as the other displays I've reviewed since its color gamut is slightly larger. The QNIX's larger color gamut won't be a problem for 99% of its buyers though. Only professionals who need a monitor with extremely accurate sRGB color space coverage will be bothered by the QNIX's larger color gamut. So while the QNIX offers the second best calibrated color quality and second best white purity of all the 2560x1440 resolution displays I've reviewed, its black levels aren't quite as good as the ViewSonic VP2770 or Asus PB278Qs because my QNIX had obvious backlight bleeding, some of which was slightly visible even with the lights on, and the QNIX's matte blacks and glossy bezel don't jive very well, while the Asus PB278Q and ViewSonic VP2770's dark gray matte bezels really help make the black look nice and deep. 
Since the Hunix uses a PLS panel, its viewing angles are identical to those of a 2560 by 1440 resolution IPS panel such as the SIPS crossover 2720 MDP which is featured on the right, and the Hunix's viewing angles are the same as the ViewSonic VP2770s, Asus PB278Q, and Samsung S27A A50D, and they are superior to the Dell U2713Hs, which uses a GB LED backlit panel. Since the Hunix uses a PLS panel, there's no need to worry about on or off axis gamma shift. No details will be lost when viewing the Hunix head on, and no details will be revealed when viewing the Hunix slightly off angle like they would be on a VA panel, like the Samsung S27C 750P I recently reviewed. My Kunix had a bit of light bleeding which was visible with the lights on in the bottom center which was somewhat annoying, especially during dark scenes. However, by pulling the front part of the casing out a little bit, I was able to alleviate some of the pressure on the panel which got rid of some of the backlight bleeding. And for the record, here's a ViewSonic VP2770. That image was taken with the same camera settings. And on the left here is my Kunix, and on the right is my crossover 2720 MDP. So notice how there's pretty much no visible screen uniformity issues on the crossover on the right, but the Kunix clearly has some. This image was taken before I fixed some of the backlight bleeding. Here's a view sonic next to the crossover, and this image was taken with the same camera settings. The Kunix lacks overdrive settings. Unlike the Asus PB278Q, ViewSonic VP2770, and Samsung S27A 850D I've reviewed. In terms of pure speed, the Qunix is slower than my crossover 2720 MDP, as well as the ViewSonic VP2770, but its pixel response times are pretty much identical to those of the Samsung S27A A50Ds when its normal setting is used, and the Samsung's normal setting gets rid of all the overshoot, and the Qunix is the same as the Asus PP278Q when the Trace Free 20 setting is used, since the default setting of Trace Free 60 causes very obvious overshoot ghosting. When the Samsung S27A A50D's normal response time setting is used, and when the Asus PP278Q's Trace Free 20 setting is used, they both basically have the same pixel response times as the Qunix. I think it's kind of sad when the Qunix has better default overdrive, despite only costing $300, than the Asus PB278Q, which retails for $700, and the Samsung S27A A50D, which retailed for $900 when it first launched in 2011. So while both the Asus PB278Q and Samsung S27A A50D's overdrive settings can be changed to get rid of the obvious overshoot, the pixel response times are slowed down as a result, resulting in more color smearing and color streaking. However, the color streaking and color smearing is still very minor, and the Qunix's pixel response times are essentially the same as the Samsung's with the normal setting and the Asus's with the Trace Free 20 setting which means that the Qunix has very good pixel response times, but it's not as fast as my crossover 2720 MDP, which uses an SIPS panel, or as fast as the ViewSonic VP2770 when its advanced setting is used. When it comes to speed, the ViewSonic VP2770 is the fastest, and it has considerably less ghosting than the crossover 2720 MDP, which has noticeably less ghosting than the Asus PB278Q, Samsung S27A A50D, and Qunix QX2710. But the Qunix is still pretty fast, and it will likely only disappoint super speedy 60Hz TN panel owners, light boost TN users, CRT users, and plasma TV users, since the Qunix only suffers from light color smearing and color streaking. However, However, the Qunix's pixel response times hold up quite well when overclocked to 96Hz. I only use 96Hz since my Qunix would artifact when overclocked to 120Hz, and 24 fits into 96, which enables the Qunix to offer judder-free film playback since movies are filmed at 24 frames per second, and 24 is a multiple of 96, while 24 is not a multiple of 60, though some 60Hz monitors are capable of handling 24 frame per second content perfectly. Most people know by now that the single input 2560 by 1440 resolution IPS and PLS panels from Korea don't have any noticeable input lag, and that is because they lack scalers. A few of the 2560 by 1440 monitors that only have dual link DVI ports have been reviewed by Prod, and they measured the display's signal delay with an oscilloscope, and models such as the Hasro HW27C 
only had a 7 millisecond signal delay, and the HP ZR2740W only had a 5 millisecond signal delay. While most of the other multi input 2560 by 1440 resolution IPS and PLS panels have 15 to 20 millisecond signal delays, except for the ViewSonic VP2770, which was tested by Prod, and it only has a 7 millisecond signal delay, so it's basically the same as the single input models. The Qnix is also a single input, dual link DVI only PLS panel, and like the other monitors I just mentioned, it too does not have any noticeable input lag. Subjectively, the Qnix does not feel quite as fast as the Asus VG248 QE I have at 60Hz, but it still feels very, very responsive. However, as I mentioned, it doesn't feel quite as responsive as a super fast, near delay free panel such as the Asus VG248 QE. Since the Qnix feels so much more obviously responsive at 96Hz, I think a lot of CRT users and possibly 120Hz TN users will likely have no problem gaming on the Qnix at 96 or 120Hz, especially with the benefit of having much better colors since the Qnix has a PLS panel. Only the most diehard CRT users, 120-144Hz to TN users, and 120Hz light boost users may have an issue with the Qnix's near negligible 60Hz delay. To see if the Qnix uses LED PWM dimming, I use the PWM method from the TFT Central article, which I will provide a link to right now, as well as the shutter speed method. The shutter speed method consists of one using a camera with a shutter speed of 1 60th a second or greater, and using a white screen to see if the black flickering lines show up, which typically do on displays which use LED PWM dimming. And my camera shutter speed goes all the way up to 1 500th of a second. Typically displays which use low LED PWM dimming frequencies, black lines will start showing up on camera with shutter speeds at 1 60th of a second. Using shutter speeds all the way up to 1 500th of a second, I was never able to see any black flickering lines on the Qnix, and I was unable to capture any vertical bands when using the PWM dimming method from TFT Central's article. My results have led me to believe that the Qnix does not use LED PWM dimming, However, I must mention that the Qnix reviewed by Dead from Overclock.ru only had a 160Hz LED PWM frequency. Either I'm wrong, Dead's wrong, or there are two versions of the Qnix, one which uses LED PWM dimming and one which does not. So it is time for the conclusion. First with the negatives, the Qnix lacks a real warranty since one would have to send it back to Korea and if they live in North America it would likely cost more than $100 to ship it back to one of the Korean companies and communicating with them would likely be very difficult. The second issue is that these are very difficult to exchange since they come from Korea and not all sellers are willing to pay return shipping or even accept a return if one gets a unit with severe backlight bleeding or get a monitor with more dead or stuck pixels than the seller's pixel policy allows. The Qnix's third issue lies with its recycled bezel, mediocre stand, and mediocre casing and assembly, since the panel has been reported to not come properly fit inside the casing. My unit was not properly placed inside the casing either, nor was the Qnix dead from overclock.ru reviewed. My biggest gripe with my Qnix is that it has some obvious backlight bleeding, some of which is visible even with the lights on in the center. However, taking out the screws and pulling the casing away a little bit in the center did help alleviate some of the light leakage. My last issue is that the matte blacks don't look as deep when paired with the glossy black bezel, despite the fact that the Qnix has the highest measure contrast ratio I've seen from a 2560 by 1440 resolution IPS or PLS panel. The ViewSonic VP2770, Asus PB27, Q and Samsung S278 850D I have reviewed all appear to have deeper blacks with the lights on since they use dark gray matte bezels. I can't really classify the image retention my Qnix suffered from once overclocked as a negative since it's not supposed to be overclocked in the first place. Image retention only occurred when keeping static images displayed on my Qnix for long periods of time once overclocked. After setting my Qnix back to 60Hz for a few hours, the image retention would disappear. I always keep my Qnix set to 60Hz when not using it for games and movies, and I recommend others do the same thing to avoid getting any permanent burn in or avoid having to see annoying image retention. And now for the positives. The Qnix has the best color presets of all of the 2560 by 1440 resolution displays I've reviewed, and the second best white purity of all of the 1440p displays I've reviewed. However, the Qnix's white purity is the best out of the box. The Samsung 850D I reviewed in 2012 beats the Qnix in terms of white purity after calibration, but out of the box, the Qnix easily wins. 
So the Cunix looks amazing out of the box, and it has very fast pixel response times, which are on par with the Asus PB278Q when its trace-free 20 setting is used, and the Samsung S27A A50D's normal settings. However, the Cunix can't quite match my crossover 2720 MDP since it suffers from a bit more color smearing and color streaking, and the Cunix can't match the ViewSonic VP2770 either, which has even less color streaking and smearing than the crossover 2720 MDP. However, the Cunix overclocks to 96Hz, allowing for smoother movie playback since movies are filmed in 24 frames per second, and the Cunix feels a lot smoother when set to 96Hz. The negative side is that when overclocked, the Cunix's gamma rises, resulting in the slight dulling and darkening of colors, as well as some black crush. Fortunately, there are those with colorometers such as myself who will provide ICC profiles to download. So remember, my ICC profiles for 60, 96, and 120 hertz are all available within my written review, which is linked to in the video description. Lastly, the Cunix uses a PLS panel, so it has very nicely but slightly oversaturated colors, no gamma shift, and very wide viewing angles, just like the other 1440p PLS panels I reviewed and the crossover 2720 MDP. The Cunix also has the same awesome light matte coating as those found on the ViewSonic VP2770, Asus PB278Q, and Samsung S27A A50D. And like the Asus PB278Q and ViewSonic, the Cunix has Samsung's improved version of this light matte coating, which is better than the coating used on the launch Samsung S27A A50Ds, which were manufactured in 2011. I think I've pretty much covered everything at this point, so remember to check out my written review for my ICC profiles as well as more information. And remember to check out Dead from Overclock.ru's Cunix review, which I will be posting a link to in the video description. Auf Wiedersehen, Granada!